last time on Fixing the Money Thing. So we're talking about our series called Other Side of Faith. What does that mean, right? The Other Side of Faith. Well, it's talking about your responsibility. You and God are doing things together. And today on The Other Side of Faith. There's a process where you're going to learn responsibility. You're going to learn what God says. You're going to follow instructions. And then you earn promotion. You're qualified to move on to the next level. And God gives you greater responsibility. What I'm saying is that you have your part to play. And God has his part to play. And we have to learn responsibility and hold to that. You and God together on the other side of faith. Now on Fixing the Money Thing. So many Christians don't get that part. They trust God, so to speak. They're looking for God to do things, but they don't know their responsibility to make sure it works together. This is the principle of Newton's law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. We have to know how this thing works to enjoy the benefits of the kingdom. The pressure and speed of the hot gases provide the force needed to turn the turbines and the ship. You gotta be involved in this process. God wants you to have every promise, but there's a part you play in it. Do something. So the other side of faith is we have responsibility over our lives. Now, God's with us. He's helping us. There's no condemnation. He's given us his word. But we are responsible to apply the word. We're responsible to dig into the word. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It means learn how his kingdom operates. Righteousness means learn what he says is right. Learn what he says how life should be lived. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. But you're responsible to understand, to seek, and to find out how it operates. One hour on Sunday morning, friends, not going not to do it. You've got to dig into the word of God. First Samuel chapter 15, look at a very famous character, King Saul of Israel. So let's find out what Saul did. So he went on this mission, right? And we find that... Let me find out what verse I want to start at here. Verse number seven. He went on a mission. He attacked the Amalekites. Verse number eight. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. And all the people he totally destroyed. But Saul and the army spared the king and the best of the sheep and cattle and all the livestock. Everything that was good. Uh, these were, they were unwilling to destroy things that were good, but they completely destroyed animals and things that were weak and uh, not worth a lot. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. I want you to underline that. He has not what? Carried out my instructions. Write the word disqualified next to that. Saul is now disqualified. Why is he disqualified? He did not carry out the Lord's instructions. Samuel was troubled, and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but was told, King Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. We have a problem, possibly. He's now set up a statue in his own honor. When Samuel, the prophet, reached King Saul... Saul says, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul said, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Stop, 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 Samuel said, stop. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Well, tell me, Saul says. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, he said. Saul said, I went on the mission the Lord assigned me to. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back the king alive. The soldiers took the sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best that was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel said, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion 
is like the sin of witchcraft or divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Now, the Bible says that rebellion is like witchcraft because if you already know what God says, if you already know what he says is right, what he wants you to do, and you don't do it, then you're turning for another answer. You're turning for someone else to give you an excuse or you're looking somewhere else to find someone to agree with your direction. Does that make sense? You're rebelling. So it's the same as witchcraft because you're essentially turning away from God and turning to Satan and his kingdom to find an excuse not to obey because you already know what to do. Are you with me? Okay, very good. So he says, to obey is better than sacrifice. To heed is better than the fat of rams. Rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Arrogance or pride is the same as idolatry. You've exalted yourself above God and you're now choosing what to do. That went over well, right? It's just, that's, just how it's, that's what the Bible says. Okay. So Saul is disqualified. Who can tell me who took his place? All you scholars, who was it? King David. Now, who's King David? He's a nobody. He's a shepherd. Shepherds were a dime a dozen. Everyone's shepherds back in that day. But David has a heart after God. He's faithful to protect the sheep. You know, he takes on the lion and the bear. He's faithful and loyal. But in Acts, the 13th chapter, they are going through the history of Israel, and they mention King David. Listen to what they said. After removing King Saul, God made David their king. God testified concerning David, quote, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Can you put that on the screen for me? This is what God's speaking. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. What does it mean to be after God's heart? A man after God's own heart. What does it say? He will do everything I want him to do. So you come to church, we, we love God, love, I love church, I love God, I even love you, Pastor, I, I, love, I love church, I love God. Fantastic. Do you do what God says? Do you do what God says? If you don't, you don't have God's heart. You see, listen, let's, let's talk about this for a minute. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments, right? Yes. All right. Drenda, when I first married her, you know, I said, I love you, I love you, you know, I love you. I thought that was, you know, thought that's what I was supposed to do. I love her, you know, I loved her. And one day she said, you don't love me. I said, well, why? I say every day I love you. She says, you don't take the trash out for me. You don't change the light bulbs. You don't care about what I care about. What, what God was saying was that David cared about what God cared about. Saul cared about himself. He built a statue to himself, Remember? So when David met Goliath, remember that story? David met Goliath. Let me pull a scripture, uh, just to point that out. In verse, uh, chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, we find this in verse number 10. Now, you, know, you know who Goliath is, right? The Philistine that was really big, and he's ranting and raving to the nation of Israel. Goliath said this, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Okay? Now, David's a shepherd. He's bringing supplies to his brothers. He's not in the army. He brings supplies to his brother, and he happens to hear Goliath ranting and raving and saying that. And here's what it says. So David goes to King Saul and says, well, I'll take him on then. He says, your servant, this is uh, verse 34, your servant has been keeping my father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Okay, here's the difference. Saul and the army were quaking in fear. David was not in fear. He was offended. In other words, he was angry. He was angry that this Philistine could defy God because David had God's heart. See, what bothered God bothered David. You see what I'm saying? 
God said, David is a man after my own heart. It doesn't mean he comes to church every Sunday or he, he worships more than anyone else or he has the gifts of the Spirit operating more in his life. It means he gets upset at evil. It bothers him. He doesn't see how close he can walk to the edge of it. He is totally disgusted and angry at it because it makes God angry and it disgusts God. He is offended at evil. He's not afraid. He's upset. Now, write the word promotion down. Saul was disqualified. David was qualified. He had the heart of God. He did what God said, and he had the heart of God. See, God can't promote you someplace that you're not disgusted at if there's situations there. In other words, we're in enemy-held camp. We're, we're in the enemy-held territory. We live in it, right? But God can't send you on a, a dangerous mission if you get out there and your life, you're not disgusted at sin. You're not bothered by it, so the enemy has you playing his game. You go out there, and he knows how to set you up before you even get out there. He's going to set a trap for you and pull you off that assignment by fall, you falling into sin or making a mistake. So God can't risk that for you. So he's going to keep you back here where you're still learning how to be loyal and faithful in a small spot. Right, you know, let's say that uh, you're a man. You have trouble with pornography. Now, you know, men, we, gotta, we have to deal with that. We have to overcome that. But you know what? If, if God can't trust me on an assignment, then I can't be trusted. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you, he has to trust you. And you have to get angry at pornography. You can't go, well, you know, I'll just kind of play around or, you know, whatever. You, you can't play with sin and win. Now, you have to trust the Holy Spirit to set you free from sin. But I'm saying that you at least have to be angry at it to start with. If you're trying to play with it then the enemy's got you before you start. 